Dragon Age Origins was rated M for Mature by the ESRB and contains blood, intense violence, language, partial nudity, and sexual content. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone. My name is Amaranth and I play games for the internet. And today I'm doing another codex reading. <clears throat> Starting with Creatures, Article 8, Corpse. To anyone who doubts the wickedness of blood magic, I say with your own hands, strike down the corpses of your own brothers who have fallen in battle to a Maleficar. Then we may discuss morality. Knight Commander Benedictus, in a letter to the Divine. 546 Exalted. The walking dead are not, as the superstitious are wont to believe, the living come back for revenge. They are, rather, corpses possessed by demons. A shambling corpse controlled by a demon of sloth causes its enemies to become weak and fatigued. Corpses possessed by rage demons go berserk and simply wade into their opponents mindlessly. Devouring corpses are held by hunger demons and feed upon the living. The more powerful demons rarely deign to possess a dead host. <clears throat> Article 23. Revenant. An entire unit of men, all slain by one creature. I didn't believe it at first, your perfection. But it appears that, it is, that this is so. We have a survivor, and while at first I thought his rantings pure exaggerations, it appears to be no simple skeleton. The descriptions of the creature's abilities were eerily similar to those of our brothers at Marnas Pell encountered almost a century ago. Men pulled through the air to skewer themselves on the creature's blade, and attacked so qu quick that it was able to assault multiple opponents at once. No, your perfection. What we have here is indeed a revenant, and nothing less. From a letter to Divine Amara III, 571 Exalted. A revenant is a corpse possessed by a demon of pride or of desire, making it amongst the most powerful possessed opponents that one can face. Many possess spells, but most are armed and armored, and prefer the use of their martial talents. They are weak against physical attacks, but regenerate quickly, and commonly use telekinesis to pull opponents into melee range should they try to flee. Revenants also have the ability to strike multiple opponents surrounding them. Stay at range, if possible, and strike quickly. That is the only way to take such a creature down. Magic and Religion Article 64 Apostates It is not uncommon for the neophyte to mistake apostates and maleficarum as one and the same. Indeed, the Chantry has gone to great lengths over the centuries to establish that this is so. The truth, however, is that while an apostate is often a maleficar, he need not be so. A maleficar is a mage who employs forbidden knowledge such as blood magic and the summoning of demons, whereas an apostate is merely any mage who does not fall under the auspice... auspice... of... I think that's the right word... auspice? of the Circle of Magi, and therefore the Chantry. They are hunted by the Templars, and quite often they will turn to forbidden knowledge in order to survive. But it will be a lie to say that all, our apost that all apostates begin that way. Historically, apostate apostates become such in one of two ways. They are either mages who have escaped from the circle, or mages who were never part of it to begin with. This latter category includes what we tend to refer to as hedge mages those who, with a magical ability out in the hinterlands who follow a different magical tradition than our own. Some of these hedge mages are not even aware of their nature. Undeveloped, their abilities can express themselves in a variety of ways, which the hedge mage might attribute to faith, or will, or to another being entirely, depending on his nature. Some of these traditions are passed down from generation to generation, as with the so-called witches of the chastened wilders, or the shamans of the Avar barbarians. No matter how a mage has become an apostate, the Chantry treats them all alike. Templars begin a systematic hunt 
to bring the apostate to justice. In almost all cases, justice is execution. If there is some overriding reason the mage should live, the right of tranquility is employed instead. Whether we of the Circle of Magi believe the system is fair is irrelevant. It is what it is. From Patterns Within Form by Halden, First Enchanter of Starkhaven, 880, Blessed. Article 67. The Commandments of the Maker. These truths that the Maker has revealed to me, as there is but one world, one life, one death, there is but one God, and He is our Maker. They are sinners who have given their love to false gods. Magic exists to serve man and never to rule over him. Foul and corrupt are they who have taken his gift and turned it against his children. They shall be named Maleficar, accursed ones. They shall find no rest in this world or beyond. All men are the work of our Maker's hands, from the lowest slaves to the highest kings. Those who bring harm without provocation to the least of his children are hated and accursed by the Maker. Those who bear false witness and work to deceive others know this. There is but one truth. All things are known to our Maker, and He shall judge their lies. All things in this world are finite. What one man gains, another has lost. Those who steal from their brothers and sisters do harm their livelihood and to their peace of mind. Our Maker sees this with a heavy heart. Transfigurations 1, 1 through 5. Article 73. The Founding of the Chantry. Cordelius Dracon, king of the city-state of Orlais, was a man of uncommon ambition. In the year 15 ancient, or minus 15 ancient? I'm gonna go with 15 ancient. The young king began construction of a great temple dedicated to the Maker, and declared that by its completion he would not only have united the warring city-states of the south, he would have brought Andrastian belief to the world. In three ancient, the temple was completed. There, in the, its heart, Dracon knelt before the eternal flame of Andraste and was crowned the ruler of the Empire of Orlais, his first act as emperor to declare the Chantry as the established Andrastian religion of the Empire. It took three years and several hundred votes before Alessa of Montsamad was elected to lead the new Chantry. Upon her coronation as divine, she took the name Justinia, in honor of the disciple who recorded Andraste's songs. In that moment, the ancient era ended and the divine age began. From Ferelden, Folklore and History, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Article 82. Demonic Possession. Why do demons seek to possess the living? History claims they are malevolent spirits, the first children of the Maker, angry at their creator for turning from them, and jealous of those creations he considered superior. They stare across the veil at the living and do not understand what they see, yet they know they crave it. They desire life. They pull the living across the veil when they sleep and prey on their psyche with nightmares. Whenever they can, they cross the veil into our world to possess it outright. We know that any demon will seek to possess it with a mage, and upon doing so will create an abomination. Most of the world does not know, however, that the strength of an abomination depends entirely on the power of the demon that possesses the mage. This is true, in fact, of all possessed creatures. One demon is not the same as any other. Demons can, for instance, be classified. Enchanter Brahms' categorization of demons into that portion of the psyche as they, they primarily prey upon has held since the Tower Age. According to Brahm, the weakest and most common of demons are those of rage. They are the least intelligent and most prone to violent outbursts against anything living. They expend their energies quickly, and the most powerful of them exhibiting great strength and occasionally the ability to generate fire. Next are the demons of hunger. In a living host, they become cannibals and vampires, 
and within the dead they feed upon the living. Theirs are the powers of draining both life force and of mana. Next are the demons of sloth, the first on Brahm's scale that are capable of true intelligence. In its true form, the demon is known as a shade, a thing that a thing which is nearly indis indistinct and invisible for such as sloth na sloth's nature. Blah. It hides and stalks, unaware, and when confronted, it sows fatigue and apathy. Demons of desire are amongst the most powerful, and are the ones most likely to seek out the living and actively trick them into a deal. These demons will exploit anything that can be coveted, wealth, power, lust, and they will always end up getting far more than they give. A desire demon's province is that of illusions and mind control. Strongest of all demons are those of pride. These are the most feared creatures to loose upon the world. Masters of magic and in possession of vast intellect, they are the true schemers. It is they who seek the most who seek most strongly to possess mages, and will bring together demons across the veil in numbers to achieve their own ends. Though although what that might be has never been discovered. A greater pride demon brought across the veil would threaten the entire world. From the Maker's First Children by Badder, Se by Badder Senior Enchanter of Ostwick, 812 Blessed. Ha! Huh. Uh, sorry. Um, Article 84 Blood Magic, the Forbidden School. Foul and corrupt are you who have taken my gift and turned it against my children. Transfigurations, 1810. The ancient Deventers did not originally consider blood magic a school of its own. Rather, they saw it as a means to achieve greater power in any school of magic. The name, of course, refers to the fact that the magic use of this type uses life, specifically in the form of blood, instead of mana. It was common common practice at one time for a magister to keep a number of slaves on hand, so that should he undertake the working of a spell that was physically beyond his abilities, he could use the blood of his slaves to bolster the casting. Over time, however, the Imperium discovered types of spells that could only be worked by blood. Although Lyrium would allow a mage to send his conscious mind into the Fade, blood would allow him to find the sleeping minds of others, view their dreams, and even influence or dominate their thoughts. Just as treacherous, blood magic allows the veil to be opened completely, so that demons may physically pass through it into our world. The rise of the Chant of Light and the subsequent fall of the old Imperium has led to blood magic being all but stamped out, as it should be, for it poses nearly as great a danger to those who would practice it as to the world at large. From The Four Schools, A Triste, by First Enchanter Josephus. Next, Culture and History, Article 108, The Thetis Calendar. <clears throat> for most good folk, the details of our calendar has little purpose. It is useful only for telling them when the Summer Day Festival will be held, when the snows are expected to begin, and when the harvest must be complete. The naming of the years are a matter for historians and taxmen and few, if pressed, could even tell you the reason that our current age is named after dragons. It is 930 dragons, the thirtieth year of the ninth age since the crowning of the Chantry's first divine. Each age is exactly 100 years, with the next age's name chosen in the 99th year. The scholars in Val Royal advise the Chantry of Portents seen in that 99th year, and Chantry authorities pour over research for months before the Divine announces the name of the imminent age. The name is said to be an omen of what is to come, of what the people of Thetis will face for the next hundred years. The current age was not meant to be the Dragon Age. Throughout the last months of the Blessed Age, the Chantry was preparing to declare the Sun Age, named for the symbol of the Orlesian Empire, which at that time sprawled over much of the south of Thetis and controlled both Ferelden and what is now Navarra. It would was to be a celebration of Elysian Imperial glory. Blah. Accent coming out of nowhere. The, 
but as the rebellion in Ferelden reached ahead, and the Battle of the River, of River Dane was about to begin, a peculiar event occurred. A rampage, the rising of a dreaded high dragon. Dragons had thought been thought practically extinct since the days of the Navarran dragon hunts, and they say that to see this great beast rise from the frost backs was both majestic and terrifying. As the rampage began and the high dragon decimated the countryside in its search for food, the elderly divine Faustine II abruptly declared the Dragon Age. Some say the divine was declaring support for Orle in the battle against Ferelden, since the dragon is an el is the since the dragon is an element of the Dryfell family. Heraldry, ah, dr Dufail family heraldry of King Megaron, the so-called usurper king of Ferelden. Be that as it may, the High Dragon's rampage turned towards the Orlesian side of the Frostback Mountains, killing hundreds and sending thousands more fleeing to the northern coast. The Ferelden rebels won the Battle of River Dane, ultimately securing their independence. Many of us think that the Dragon Age will come to represent a time of violent and dramatic change for all of Thedas. It remains to be seen. From the Studious Theologian by Brother Genitivi, Chantry Scholar, 925 Dragon. But it's not 930. Wait, it. But. Okay. <laughs> Article 127 Lake Callanhad. The waters of Lake Callanhad are steeped in legends. The Avar people say that it was once the site of Belenas, the mountains which stood at the center of the world, from which Korth the Mountain Father surveyed the earth and sky, but it was destroyed in the battle between Korth and the serpent Nathramar, leaving only a vast crater behind. When the Lady of the Skies saw that Belenas was gone, she wept, and her tears filled the crater, making the lake. The Tevinters believed that the waters of Lake Kalanhad were blessed by Razakel, Razakel, god of mysteries, and that those who drank from them were granted special insights. This is why they had built the great tower on an island in the middle of the lake, hoping the powers of the lake would aid their magical research. But most of us know the legend of King Kalanhad, which gives the place its name. It is said that Kalanhad Therian... Therian? Therian? Nah spent a year and a day in the Tower of Magi. Each day he drew a single cup of full water from the lake and carried it to the Fomari at the top of the tower. By magic, each cup of water was forged into a single ring of the mail of armor that the circle gave to Kalanhad. In that armor, made from the lifeblood of the land itself, no blade could strike him, no arrow pierce him, so long as he stood on Ferelden soil. From Thedas, Myths and Legends, by Sister Patrine. Chantry Scholar. Article 152, Redcliffe. King Callanhad Therian was once famously declared the fate of Redcliffe is the fate of Wolf Ferelden. Certainly the castle is the first and last defense for the sole land route into Ferelden, and the country has never fallen to any force that did not first c capture Redcliffe. The castle, which despite being three times captured, is popularly described as unassailable, also guards one of the largest and most prosperous towns in Ferelden. Redcliffe Village is well suited, is well situated, sorry, near the mountain pass to Orzammar and the Orlesian border, and so serves as a center of foreign trade. For these reasons, Redcliffe is a accounted to an Arling, despite the smallness of the domain. The inhabitants of Redcliffe Village are primarily fishermen or merchants who ship dwarven goods through the pass from Orlais to Denerim. When the entire village smells of smoked fish on a certain late autumn mornings, the merchants in their finery do their utmost to pretend otherwise. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by J but Brother Genitivi. <laughs> I don't remember if I uh, read out 
Alistair's most recent one. So I'm going to do it again anyway. You know, one good thing about the Blight is how it brings people together. Alistair was a novice Templar when Duncan recruited him into the Grey Wardens, or rescued him, as Alistair would say. His mother was a serving girl who died when Alistair was very young. He was raised by Eamon Garen, Arl of Redcliffe for a time. <clears throat> the Arl's wife, Isolde, suspected the reason her husband took an interest in the welfare of a servant's child was that Alistair was Eamon's son. She insisted the boy be sent away to the Chantry. Isolde's suspicions were unfounded, however. Alistair was not Eamon's son, but King Merrick's. Eamon Eamon sheltered the boy to hide his existence from C Queen Rowan, Eamon's sister. <sighs> mm. That was Article 162. Now we move on to Article 167, Connor Gren. I feel like I'm sleeping, but I guess I'm not. While most of the bands and arles of Ferelden cart their children with them to the landsmead in the interest of eventually marrying them off, Connor has spent his entire life at Redcliffe, and it's hardly surprising. The child possessed the gift of magic. By law, he should have been taken to the Circle of Magi at the first sign, abdicating his claim to Redcliffe. Instead, the boy was kept out of public view and his magic hushed up, with disastrous results. All magens are beacons that attract the attention of fade spirits. Because of this, they are trained and tested by the circle to ensure that they can withstand attacks from malevolent fade creatures that seek entry into the waking world. Untrained Connor drew the intention of a powerful demon that tore the veil asunder. Article 176. Arl Rendon Howe. It appears that it will be civil war after all, despite the darkspawn. Pity. The Arling of the Arling of Aberanthine winds along the sinuous northeastern coast of Ferelden. The waking sea is known for its temper, and the storms that sweep in from the warmer northern waters are sudden and brutal. These are the lands of Rendon Howe. He was born during the occupation and, like many of the nobles at the time, joined Prince Merrick's rebels. He fought alongside young Bryce Cooslin, future Tairn of Hyever, and Leonis Bryland, future Arl of Southreach, at the bloody Battle of White River. It was the most catastrophic defeat of the entire occupation, from which only fifty rebel soldiers escaped alive, although he was decorated for valor by King Ver by King Merrick. <laughs> King Varric. <laughs> Not this game. Howe's abrasive manners have earned him almost universal dislike among his peers. Article 178. Arlesa Isolde. For the one who delivers the sacred ashes of Our Lady will have the esteem of Redcliffe and all the riches that it is in my power to grant. The Arling of Redcliffe was a source of constant trouble for Emperor, Emperor Revelle during the occupation. It was rumored that since each new report sent the Emperor that since each new report sent the Emperor into a fit of rage, his court had taken to poisoning messengers before they could deliver their accounts. Isolde's family was the tenth to be given the difficult task of governing Redcliffe, and since most of the previous Arles had either been murdered by their bands or beheaded by the Emperor, they did not approach the job with a great deal of enthusiasm. Isolde met Iman, not realizing he was the rightful heir to her father's domain, and quickly became smitten with him for being part of the resistance, never mind that it was her family he was resisting. Perhaps a bit too romantic for her own good, she insisted upon staying behind with Iman when the rest of her family was driven out. Article 180. Loghain Maktir Understand this. I will brook no threat to this nation, from you or anyone. Loghain was born a farmer during a time when his country was under foreign occupation. When he was still a boy, he joined the resistance, where his considerable tactical genius quickly became apparent. He became close friends with Prince Merrick, the last true heir to the Ferelden throne, and together they led the rebels to drive out the forces of the Orlesian Empire. Merrick raised his friend to the nobility, and Loghain is now more of a symbol than a man. 
He represents the Ferelden ideals of hard work and independence. During the battle at Ostagar, he fled the field, leaving King Caelan and the Grey Wardens to die. He then returned to Denerim and declared himself the regent to his daughter, Queen Enora, demanding that Ferelden follow him against the Darkspawn, upsetting a great many of the bands. His actions sparked a civil war. Loghain's supporters found themselves fighting their neighbors who blamed Loghain for the death of the king, as well as those who simply wished to take advantage of the power vacuum. Article 184. Sten. Either you have an enviable memory, or a pitiful life, to know nothing of regret. The northern islands are remote, lush jungles that harbor cities rumored to be the most extraordinary ever built. These are the lands of the Canari, lands that no foreign eyes ever see. Only the stories of the three exalted marches waged against the giants have reached the south, until the arrival of Sten. The stoic giant in the cage was surely the strangest thing the people of Lothering had ever seen, until the blight struck. He was sent with a small group of Canari soldiers to investigate the blight and report back. Outside Lothering, they were ambushed by Darkspawn. They fought off the attack, but only Sten survived. Farmers found him dying and took him in, but when he awoke, alone and unarmed, he panicked, killing the entire family. Realizing he, sa he had sacrificed his honor, Sten waited for the villagers to come and surrendered, expecting death. His sword and his honor restored. Sten chose to continue with Faria and take the battle to the Archdemon. And finally, uh, Article 189. Zavran... Uh, Zavran... Aranai. Arainai. Arainai? Arainai. The crows send their regards. Between the Tevinter Imperium, Ravain, and the Free Marches sits in the nation of Antiva. Although it possesses few resources of its own, Antiva's location makes it a center for trade in the north, and the capital, Antiva City, is the wealthiest in the world. Antiva has virtually no army. The monarchy is too weak to support one. Most Antivans would be hard-pressed to even name the current king, as the true, pa true power lies in the hands of a dozen merchant princes, each with a personal army, and each locked in a constant struggle for power against all the others. Anyone would think that, then that Antiva would be a ripe target for invasion by one of her neighbors, but even the Canari leave Antiva alone for a very good reason the House of Crows. The most efficient, most feared, and most expensive guild of assassins in the world calls Antiva their home, and their reputation alone defends the borders. Zivran was the crow contracted by Loghain to assassinate Alistair and, Far and Faria. One failed attempt later, however, and he found himself at the mercy of his would-be victims. They showed him unexpected mercy, and in return he swore to aid the wardens on their quest to end the blight. Books and Songs Article 193 The Ballad of Islay The wind that stirs their shallow graves Carries their song across the sands Heed our words, hear our cry The grey are sworn, in peace we lie Heed our words, hear our cry Our names recalled, we cannot die When darkness comes and swallows light Heed our words, and we shall rise From the battle from the Ballad of Islay, said to have been written after the Battle of Islay, which ended the Fourth Blight, 520 Exalted. Article 197 The Legend of Callanhad, Chapter 1 Prior to the, crown the crowning of King Callanhad, Ferelden was little more than a collection of independent Arlings and Tyrnirs. And Tyrnirs. I got nothing that warred on each other constantly over petty matters. Callanhad was born 510 Exalted, as the third son of the High Ever Merchant on Hard Times. He was eventually sent to a distant cousin, a poor young knight named Sir Foranan, who made Callanhad his squire and dog handler. As the tale goes, Sir Foranan and his squire ca became caught up in one of the wars of unity at the time. Aro Miradin was a strong but generally disliked man who was making a bid for the kingship. 
for Inan's own lord, a young fool of an Arl named Trinidor. No older than Kellen had, was besieged by Meriden's forces at his castle, today known as West Hill. When Meriden called Tend Tenedor out to parley, the young Arl asked for a volunteer from among the squires, someone who could masquerade as Tenedor in the parley party. Kellen had kneeled before Tenendor and asked for the honor. Much to Tenendor's and Sir Fornan's dismay, Kellen had immediately identified himself to Arl Mirrodin. When asked by the Arl why he was here, Kellen had explained that he had been asked to take the place of his lord. The Arl said that he had planned to kill Tenendor. Was Kellen had willing to die in his lord's place as well? Kellen had impressed Mirrodin and his allies by saying that he was. Mirrodin offered Kellen had a place at his own squire, as his own squire, but Kellen had refused, stating that if Mirrodin had planned on betraying the right of parley, he was no man of honor. Mirrodin's allies laughed at that, and Mirrodin himself conceded that Kellen had had a point. He allowed Kellen had to return to the castle safely and launched his final assault. During the assault, both, both Tenendor and Forenen were killed, but Kellen had found himself in one-on-one -on -one combat with Arl Mirrodin. In front of all Mirrodin's allies, Kellen had defeated the Arl and commanded that he call off his armies. The Arl asked Kellen had, who he professed to serve now, if both his knight and his lord were dead, to which Kellen had replied that he would do, do as his honor bade him to, for he had nothing else. "'You are not a man known for your honor,' Kellen had said, "'but I believe you wish to be. You allowed me to live once, so now I do the same for you. Perhaps if more of our people lived by honor, we would learn to trust each other long enough to live together. And with that, Kellen had withdrew his sword. I am humbled by your words, Arl Meriden told Kellen had, dropping to one knee. To his allies, he shouted that he now knew he would never be king, but he knew who should be. With that, Meriden pledged allegiance to Kellen had, whom he named Tyrn and ruler over Tenendor's lands. From the legend of Kellen had, by Brother Heron, Chantry Scribe, 810 Blessed. Article 202 The History of the Chantry, Chapter 2 When the prophet Andraste and her husband Maferath arrived at the head of their barbarian horde, Southern Tevinter was thrown into chaos. The Imperium had defended against invasions in the pa past, but now they stood without pr the protection of their gods, with their army in tatters and their country devastated by the blight. Many felt that the timing of the invasion was yet another of the Maker's miracles in Andraste's campaign to spread his divine word. Andraste was more than simply the wife of a warlord, after all. She was also the betrothed of the Maker. Enraptured by the melod melodic sound of her voice as she sang to the heavens for guidance, the Maker himself appeared to Andraste and proposed that she come with him, leaving behind the flawed world of humanity. In her wisdom, Andraste pleaded with the Maker to return to his people and create a paradise, create paradise in the world of men. The Maker agreed, but only if all the world would turn away from the worship of false gods and accept the Maker's divine commandments. Pardon me. Armed with the knowledge of the one true God, Andraste began the exalted march into the weakened Imperium. One of the Maker's commandments, that magic should serve man rather than rule over him, was as honey to the souls of the downtrodden of Deventer, who lived under the thumbs of the Magisters. Word of Andraste's exalted march of her, of her miracles and military successes spread far and wide. Those in the Imperium who felt the old gods had abandoned them eagerly listened to the words of the Maker. Those throngs of restless citizens that destroyed temples now did so in the name of the Maker and his prophet Andraste. As Maferath's armies conquered the lands of southern Tevinter, so did Andraste's words conquer hearts. It is said that the Maker smiled on the world at the Battle of Valarian Fields, in which the forces of Maferath challenged and defeated the greatest army Tevinter could muster. The southern reaches of the mighty Imperium now lay at the mercy of the barbarians. Faith in the Maker, bolstered by such miracles, threatened to shake the foundations of the Imperium apart. Of course, the human heart is more powerful than the greatest weapon, and when wounded, it is capable of the blackest deeds. From Tales of the Destruction of Thetis by Brother Genetivi, Chantry Scholar. And last but not least, 
Article 225, Cautionary Tales for the Adventurous. It was then that he realized he wasn't alone. The abandoned camp in front of him was unbelievably welcoming, like a mirage. The fire felt like a warm hand grabbing his heart. It reminded him of a previous life so long ago when he was happy, running on the sunflower fields with his boy, the sun on his face, laying next to the fireplace with his beautiful wife in his arms. He felt a sharp pain in his heart. His thoughts shifted to the fateful day when everything changed. Blood was everywhere. He held the body of his dead wife in his arms. Around him the ashes of his burned house fell like snow. The stench was terrible. It smelled like darkspawn. He grabbed his axe, touched the icy cold hands of his boy, and left. He would kill them. He would kill them all. The pain in his heart was unbearable. He opened his eyes and saw the second most terrifying thing he would see in his life. A shadowy wraith leaning over him, leeching his life away. Around him the camp was gone, replaced by something familiar, almost peaceful. Bones, death, and despair. He wondered if all his life had been an illusion, if he'd ever had a family. For a brief moment he felt relief. You can't lose something you never had. But being this close to death brought clarity. He knew it was real. Everything else was the illusion. You could see the smile on his torn face. He had been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. He lifted his weak arms, grasped the demon's face, and kissed it. It felt like kissing a cloud made of sand and dust. Suddenly all sorrow left him, and with it, the last bit he, of life he had. Before his lim limp body hit the ground, it was all over. He was finally free. From Cautionary Tales for the Adventurous by Brother Ram Ramos of Yilhermen. 794 Storm And with that completed, I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.